Christy and my story was the first to be told in the series uh, through Helen Back, um, which was created by Josh. I was really happy to be a part of it. I feel like the experience for me, um, it was good and it was also difficult. It helped me grow in a lot of ways. A lot of people were able to see what I'd been through and see that I came through it on the other side and that I'm still okay. And the fact that Josh put it out there for other people to see definitely helped some people. And I had a lot of people come to me after that. It's also opened up some doors for me. I think because of what Josh did, my story is good, going to actually reach a whole lot of other people. So as difficult as it was for me to tell my story and then even more difficult to watch it back, it was definitely worth it. Um, some of the people who watched it and came to me and, you know, talked to me about things was just kind of incredible uh, to see what this series actually can do and how it can help people. And I'm ready to hear what, you know, other people have to say. I just think that it's a good idea to start telling our stories. And Josh puts it out there in a way um, that's sympathetic to that. And it's not condescending and it's not hurtful. Um, but I do believe it can help people. So I hope that he continues to do the series and that people continue to watch and that it continues to grow and that it continues to help. So thank you, Josh, for letting me be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to the next installment. So I can just tell you about, um, I can just tell you about the last few years, I guess, man. Here's what I'll tell you. I'll tell you what God has taught me about other people and what they're going through. And uh, um, I've always, I grew up in a rough family. It's dysfunctional. We had lots of problems. Okay, lots of problems. Um, lots of struggles all throughout my childhood. So, growing up, I thought I had gathered a, a fairly good amount of understanding of how trauma affects people and fighting through difficult situations and, and what it feels like to hurt and suffer. And, and I've been went through a lot. So, my brothers and sisters go through a lot. My, my, my dad's life, his childhood, it's a, it's a horror story. You know what I mean? It's so... I, I, experience a lot of trauma myself also know other people and what they've gone through and seeing the goods and the bads people who let it crush them and people who seem to overcome it so I thought I had a good understanding of, of dealing with struggles and trauma and pain pain specifically even if it's not something I've been through and I mean, the thing I know now is that that's ridiculous You know, life is short. And sometimes... <laughs> you 
just don't know, you know, what's going to happen in the future. You try to think that you're trying to do your best. You're really not. <laughs> Thought I was doing good. Thought I was doing the right thing. You know, I didn't realize how fucked up my body was and my health. <laughs> you know, and the doctor tells you, you know, one day you might not just wake up. So what happened was, we were, we were uh, expecting our third child. Grayson Michael Miller was gonna be his name, is his name, I should say. And we got about six months into the pregnancy and my little brother just had his second kid. It was January, 2019. His second kid, second son was just born. And we were about to have our third son. I got two amazing little boys already and about to have our third son and man just so excited got to see the excitement of my little brother having his second son and you know, I'm holding his son and I'm just like man three more months three more months we're gonna have another another little boy a little bundle of joy and um, man I was super dedicated we were working hard at the church um, God was taking us into a different direction we kind of felt him we were prepping for it and um, I was and I was like hardcore doing great. I mean, doing all the good things that you do when you think you're doing good as a Christian. It's praying and reading my Bible and studying and working. And, and you know, a full-time job on top of the church stuff. So I was working hard at work, working hard at church, um, doing all the good Christian things. And we, we had, a, had a little vacation. Um, got about a week and a half off or two weeks. And we were just getting back out of that. Get to work on Tuesday morning. I'm at my desk, and uh, and uh, my wife had a, a routine. You know, she's six months pregnant. Routine checkup, and uh, she called me, and she told me that I needed to come over to where she was, and that they couldn't find a heartbeat for the baby. And, and uh, that, that sucked, man. Like everything just shifted, it just changed right there. Like it doesn't make any sense. I was doing everything right. <laughs> I was doing all the right good Christian things, you know? I was trying hard, even to the point of, you know, running a church and uh, so I'm, I have this conversation with God on my way to the hospital. Why? It doesn't make any sense. We did everything right. This, the whole thing. And we get there and you know, we, we prayed, God, you know, put my hand on her belly. I tried, right? And, you know, immediately beat myself up. Well, if I had had enough faith, the baby would have come back to life, right? You always say stuff like that in the moment. And, uh. It didn't, it didn't though, it didn't, it didn't work, it didn't come back to life. And then we, had, we went from the doctor's office right across the street from the hospital essentially, and we went to the hospital. And we had to go through all of the steps of having a baby. You're in that hospital room for a day or two. She's in a lot of pain, they induced her. And, the whole thing, man. The whole thing of labor and all that. Only when the baby's born, he, he, he was dead. He was, he was a dead baby. And it's heartbreaking. It was the most incredible pain I've ever felt in my life. And it broke me. 
it was mainly me, right? Committed to not being so busy that we don't spend time with our kids. I was so, so in on the church stuff. And it's nothing wrong with church. I'm not saying church is bad. But we were so in on it, man, that like I had my family up there like four times a week sometimes. And we were just going. We did. We did church service we did bible study we did we did prayer meetings we did you know we had music practice and then we had outreach events on weekends and stuff on saturdays so I mean, there were some days where you had monday and tuesday where my family wasn't up there at the church two days two days every other day we're at the church and look there's nothing wrong with working hard for god but you got to remember what life's what god really wants you to do and God slowed us down, man. He slowed us way down. We take more time with our kids, more vacations. I didn't take vacation for like five years, man. And um, we actually stopped having church services. But my whole point, my whole point is just to stay on top. You might want to cut some of that out, Josh. It's really not kind of what you're looking for. But my whole point is this, like regardless of what what you're going through no matter how bad it is i'm not going to pretend i know all right but i i remember when we went through that i don't remember who called and prayed for one a lot of people i don't remember um what they said or any encouraging words but i remember the people the stuff that they were doing and they were there and they were with us and they opened up their lives to us for whatever we needed in that moment in that struggle i don't i don't have all the answers for people and i can't i can't begin to imagine what people are going through and i can't begin to tell you how to get through every situation you're facing but every one of us every single one of us can be there for somebody. You know, I don't really get it. You know, life is so important. But we seem to lose it all from depression. You know, losing a family member money losing a loved one you know this this year has hit me hard I know big time with so many people I know good friends of mine you know who passed away because of this virus that's going on in this world but I never thought it would take a toll on millions of people that's why I'm making this documentary to help people so people are aware that they're not alone I'm doing this because I care and I'm helping you guys see this as a message of hope and love because you're not alone My name is Dustin Lawrence. I am 39 years old. I'm married, have a couple kids, and uh, I'm diagnosed with major depressive disorder, MDD, with uh, generalized anxiety and ADHD. And I guess my story kind of, I, I, I've battled on and off throughout my life with anxiety, and a lot of my depression stems from my, uh, my anxiety as well as my ADHD not being treated. And so for me, I've, I've been able to hide it kind of all my life, just, you know, kind of cower away for a little bit. But uh, probably about seven, eight years ago, uh, we had, you know, some medical issues happen in my family uh, where I was kind of, I felt 
that it was my responsibility as a man to really step up and to, and to be the provider and to uh, be the strong one in the rock. And I, was, and I was good for a while. And eventually I started manifesting symptoms. Uh, I started having panic attacks for the first time in my life. Um, and I was able to hide it for a little bit. And for me, I didn't want to admit that I, that I was weak, that I uh, had a weakness or that I was struggling or going through something because I didn't want to hurt. I didn't want to put that stress on my family, but also I wanted to appear to be completely self-reliant, to be complete, to be the rock of my family, uh, to um, basically be perfect. And I demanded perfection out of myself. And a lot of, and, and I, I believe that's a lot of reasons that my anxiety started manifesting. And I would have upwards of seven, eight panic attacks a day. And for a while, I was able to hide it. I would just lay on the floor and just start breathing heavy or uh, go into the bathroom and just go through it. I came to realize very quickly, uh, as my panic attacks started manifesting in front of my family, that it was my duty and responsibility, uh, not only to my family, but to myself, to, to seek out the help that was needed, to seek out uh, friends, to talk openly about the issues and the things I was going through, and that helped. But most of all, trying to do life on my own, trying to really define who I was by what I did and the perfection I demanded out of myself um, helped me to realize that I was not, that I'm not created for myself um, and that perfection, whatever that is, um, was something that was beyond the human cap my human capability to reach. So eventually I, I felt the life go out of my eyes, I guess the best way I could put it, to where I started losing interest in everything that I once had an interest in. I lost interest in God, went and stepped in and did about with atheism. I lost interest in sports. I lost interest in doing things, having friends and relationships. And I started self-sabotaging because of it. I figured that before people could find out how weak I really was, I would just abandon them. And uh, very quickly I fell into depression. And as that would happen, I would just find myself sitting for hours, unable to even determine what it was I was going to do or supposed to be doing. And that was kind of the, uh, the epitome of, of basically being an empty shell walking around. For me, my hope came when I had a complete mental break earlier in uh, 2021, in March. I, I literally had a, I had a mental break. I got very sick. I uh, basically couldn't hide anything anymore from anybody. And for me, that was, that was the moment where I woke up and I realized that that, that it is, it's God that defines me and that God has already defined me from birth and that reaching out is seeking for help is not weakness but strength and it is my duty to my children, to my family, to my, uh, to my friends and to myself most of all to become the person that I know that I can be because I'm not reliant on my own abilities but on the grace that God has given me and the image that I was made in. And so this has caused me to be transparent, more open, more, more committed, because I realize that in this world, you will have trouble, but it's taking heart and, allow, and realizing that Christ has overcome the world. And it is my hope that anybody going through this can learn a lesson from me. Learn that there are people out there. There are friends. There are people you can lean on. There's help and to reach out when you need it so that you don't have to go through the things that I went through and the struggles that I've had to constantly endure. Um, and come to find out my anxiety and my major depressive disorder is stemmed from my untreated attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And once I was treated for that, 
my depression and my anxiety went into 100% remission. And so there are people out there that are trained to help. There's a God who loves us beyond our own ability to love ourselves, even when we can't. And there's a hope in just knowing that you're here for a purpose. And what God wants out of us is obedience. Not necessarily to flip the world on its head because he can do that all himself and he has. And it's my prayer that those who struggle will reach out for the help that they need. That they will begin talking and opening up to people and realizing that not all crosses we're called to bear are visible. That sometimes they are invisible. And we have a God that wants to heal us completely. And that's my story. I am lonely. I'm feeling anxious. I'm depressed. Your brain, every single day, every single night, all these neurons are firing. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I pick the gun up? Should I pick the knife up? Should I take these pills? Look in the mirror. Look at yourself. Tell yourself you're strong, you're beautiful. You have courage. You have a full long life ahead of you. Don't let things get you down. I'm going to be okay. When mental health, it almost feels like you're silent. You got that gun in your hand, you got that knife, Suicide. you got pills. You runs just... through your mind, runs through everybody's mind. Every single day, every I single need you second. To burn the People are doing the it. And when they do so commit suicide, or even attempt suicide, they are passing that pain I need you to stop covering pain their with loved drugs ones. because it's only like and putting best friends. bricks on a shallow past, shelf suicide has played a big part in my home. life and with my and friends close friends you get depressed I simply you feel tell like you, you have no one to talk to going. the world does not to want to hear about suicide that you are strong. If you go into the emergency room and you say you're suicidal, you know you're not alone. they look at you like you're crazy. They put you in a room with a camera. See, many people Doors are open. The pain of their Maybe someone's it's sitting like outside the door watching your every move. Piece of your body. They take your shoelaces. Your they take your belt. Piece of your heart. They take everything away from you. Medications. It's all they want to we do is the pump medications the, down the your throat. We Constantly, we medications, medications, medications. Take this, take this, take this. Guess what? Medications are just a band aid. They don't do nothing. It's a temporary fix. It may help you for like six months to a year, but then your insurance fails. Now you have no insurance. You can't pay for your medication. Medications, hundreds of dollars. What do you do now? Now you're withdrawing. So you have withdrawal symptoms. That makes it even worse. That can make you even more suicidal. The suicide. Suicide rates are going up so high just because of the holidays. Holidays play a big factor with suicide. Loved ones, missed loved ones, not sitting at the dinner table celebrating the holidays of whatever the religion is or whatever they celebrate. They get depressed. Deaths in the family. It happens. It is invisible. But people need to talk up. about it. You don't bury smiles. your problems. Shows up with with nice you need to talk about it. And that's why I'm making this video. Is because I've had my own personal problems. I've had my grandmother's back to back deaths. Within months. I seek help. I seek treatment. But when you do, when you walk into these places, they look at you like... You're crazy. You need to be handcuffed. You need to take 20 different pills. We need to sedate you. It's not that. You're crying out to be heard. You are there for help.
not there for restraint and to be criticized. You can have this. anger, anxiety. You could be bipolar, schizophrenic. You can function with these mental illnesses as a father, as a mother, as a stepfather, as a stepmother, as a parental guardian. You can do these things in day-to-day -day life. You can hold a professional career and do these things. You don't need to take thousands of medications. You just need to learn the coping tools and skills. And when those are learned, life is so much easier. Because when you're going through your tough times, there are people there. Like this guy. The animal making this film. He is there for you. This is what it's all about. Awareness of what's going on in your head. My name is Raven. I'm 28 now, but my story begins when I was like 13. Um, my sister had this boyfriend at the time. I guess he was her fiance. And he seemed like a, like a really cool guy. And I loved hanging out with them. I loved when they moved back in with us. Until one night, we were all out by the pool. And he was like throwing me in the pool and you know nothing seemed out of the ordinary until he started like touching some areas that you shouldn't touch especially on a 13 year old kid but I didn't really think anything of it because you know he was throwing me in the pool so maybe his hand just like slipped and then my sister went to bed and it escalated from there and he would sneak into my bedroom when she was sleeping we went on vacation to Virginia with all of our family and he would wait until his kids were asleep until she was asleep until my parents were asleep to do stuff and I probably should have made some kind of noise at that point but I never did and I was talking to my friend and she told me that I needed to tell my parents and you know being a kid you know especially when you don't talk about that kind of stuff with your parents it's kind of embarrassing you kind of feel like you're gonna get in trouble for it so I finally got the guts to tell my mom and of course you know me being how I am I started laughing about it because it was embarrassing for me to tell my mother stuff like that but then she didn't believe me and she kept asking me are you sure this happened are you sure you're not lying and I never understood why why she didn't believe me. Like, I know I probably would lie about so much stuff back then. I mean, what what teenager doesn't? You know, like, all teenagers lie to feel cool, to fit in at school and everything. So, but I, I, I've never lied about something like that. I, I wouldn't do that. And the only thing she told me was to not tell my sister because she was pregnant. she was going to be getting married so I kind of took it out on my sister because I felt like she should know she should know that there was something going on and she was my best friend at the time so I figured she should know that there's something different there's something wrong and we would get in all these fights and I remember just yelling at her as loud as I could, I could tell you something, but I can't. And 
she would just look at me and she'd be like, tell me, then tell me. And I would look at my mom and I'd look at her and I'd be like, I can't. And I felt like she should have knew at that point. And then one day it just came out. I was tired of fighting with her. I was tired of her not knowing and I told her. She asked me something like, why are you like this? And I told her, why don't you ask him where he touched me? And his reaction was no emotion. And he said, ew, really, that's gross. Just like that, no emotion in his voice at all. And I'm like, how could you believe that? over me and she didn't believe me and she still married him and that was her choice and things just got worse from there like I tried to still be in her life but she didn't understand what was going on she didn't understand I was telling her the truth maybe she would have understood if Maybe my mom talked to her better, but she never did. And I remember one time I got the cops called all on me because I was freaking out and like back then trying to deal with all of that as a teenager and then being bullied in school on top of it over everything, over braces, over the way you looked, over your weight, everything, and then dealing was something no child should have to deal with on top of it. I was acting out all the time in any way I could. And I believe it was my oldest sister who caught the cops. And when they got there, they took me to a mental facility where I told them everything because I felt like maybe this is finally my time to get some help. Well, from there, they made a child psychologist talk to me and I told her everything. Because it wasn't just him that did it. There was a kid that lived down the street that was also doing stuff to me too. That once again, nobody believed me about. So I was talking to this child psychologist and she was trained to know when children are lying to her. So she knows what to tell parents, she knows what to tell investigators. And she looked my mom straight in the eyes and said she is not lying about anything. And I think that's when my mom finally decided to believe it. It had to come from somebody else, but she finally believed it. And she never told my sister. She never told my sister that she found out I was telling the truth. So, my teenage years were pretty hard to go through all of that by myself and not have anybody to really be there for me for it. And the only time it stopped, the only time he stopped was a year later because I had finally gotten a boyfriend. And I remember I had just gotten out of the shower and he was trying to like take my towel off of me. And I told him I will call my boyfriend. And he was actually a little intimidated by this 14 year old kid because, you know, the 14 year old kid I was dating, he had a lot of muscles. And this guy was like a, a stick compared to him. So he left me alone then. But my sister is finally back in my life now. And she's talking to me and we're working on making our relationship what it used to be and her kids are finally back in my life. Cause I really miss them. I missed her, her middle one. I missed her growing up completely. I don't have a single picture of her when she was a baby. And they used to think I was a bad person. I, I don't know what, I don't know if my sister was saying stuff about me or maybe it was him. But they used to ask my mom if I was still a bad person. 
and I never understood that. Like, what did I do? That was so wrong. But it's finally starting to get better. I don't think about it as much as I used to anymore. I try not to let it affect my life like it used to anymore. But I'm just glad I finally have my sister back. I'm happy that I can show her that I'm not a bad person. That yes, I did go through a stage where I was a little bit crazy, but I'm not that person anymore. And I don't want to be that person ever again. I want to do better. I want to make sure that my girls don't have to ever feel the way I did. Because I really miss them. I didn't think it was going to actually cry. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever it may be. As you know, we all know Joshua, but we really know him as the animal. The animal. And he asked me, he asked, do me a favor, George. Will you just say some positive things? Maybe say something really nice to people. Make them think about their life. Maybe think about what they have, not what they don't have. Make them think that, you know, life is really good. So I'm going to say this to you and I'll make it short and I'll make it sweet. I'm not going to come up with a bunch of things for you to start thinking because it'll just make you very confused. I get confused. I'm just going to say this one thing, maybe two things tops. If you want to have a really good day each day and you want to be very proud of yourself every single day, try this for seven days. Seven days what I do on a daily and people think I'm really weird. My wife gives me crap, but you know what? This is how I get through my days. Everybody loves to be loved. Everybody wants to hear that word, I love you. Nothing makes us feel so much powerful and so much better when we know somebody loves us. Some people may disagree, but you, you know what? I'm sorry that you disagree, but don't disagree. Try this, and you're gonna find yourself being a better person. You're gonna love better yourself, and you're gonna love other people better from this point on. You wake up in the morning time. I've said this a thousand times, and it works. You wake up in the morning time, and the first person you see in the mirror is what? Is you. The first person you may see in the morning is who? Is you. One more time. It's you. You. Everything starts with you. So this makes total sense to me. Wake up each morning. I look in the mirror and I say, you know what? First and foremost, thank you for another day. Thank you. And then you look in the mirror a little bit deeper. And you look in your own eyes in the mirror and you say, you know what? I love you. I know we have struggles, George. I know we don't, we're not perfect, George. But you know what? I know you do the best you possibly can to make people smile. You do the best you possibly can to make yourself smile, and you do your best to best not to just exist, but to live your life. Give you two powerful, two powerful situations that you need to try for seven days. And if it doesn't work, then I'm sorry, but I know it will work. I know it will make a difference in your life and in my life, because I know I helped you. Number one, as you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, like I said, and you tell yourself, you know what, I really love you, and I know you're doing the best you possibly can, but I'm proud of you can't ask more than that Two, the second thing you want to do is seriously when you leave when you start leaving that the house or you go to work whatever as soon as you walk out those doors you say to yourself you know what you say to yourself you know what today i'm not gonna just exist i'm gonna live i'm gonna choose to live today i'm gonna give it everything i have today and if you do that on a daily you're gonna see your health get better you're gonna see yourself smile more and you know what a lot of things in a positive way are gonna change your all I got for you. Simple. Everybody take care of yourself. Joshua, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I hope that I touch somebody that they can actually say, you know what, that really makes sense. And thank you so much. Man. Joshua, thanks again for this opportunity to maybe touch some life. All right, you guys go do it. Remember, don't just exist, live your life. And remember, live your life whose way? Not his way. Not her way. Nobody's way. Only your way. <laughs>